In 80 days, adventurer and award-winning filmmaker Paul G. Roberts retraces the global footsteps of Phileas Fogg, hero of Jules Verne's most famous work. Land in Newark, Thursday the 21st. It's been a while since I've been in New York City. Well, I've been in New Jersey at the moment. Soon to be in New York City. I'm going to try back up. Another one of the world's truly great mega cities. Jay Z, the billionaire rapper who once sold crack on the city streets below, calls it the Empire State. You might know it as the Big Apple. But whatever you know it as, it's one of the major urban centers of the world. When I lived here in my mid 20s, I believed, and I still do today, it's the ultimate urban experience. There may be bigger cities, there may be more populated cities, there may be cities with bigger sky rises, like Shanghai. But to me, New York will always be the Big Apple. Amazing Grand Central Station. The whole body of works and everything is one of the great wonders of the world. 
It was built by one of America's wealthiest families, the Vanderbilts. Probably there are only two, like the Rockefellers and the Vanderbilts. And it's, it is still a modern marble. The main part here, it's stunning. It's absolutely exquisite. And it's not like your traditional railway station. There's no screeching voices about trains and tracks and delays. It, it's actually more like a temple. In fact, Apple has one of its major flagships up those stairs. Today's Grand Central is a far more sleek version than the one I knew when I lived here. I commuted each day through it in the 90s. Back then, it was a horror show. It was dirty, poorly maintained, and the residents of choice for legions of the homeless. It smelled like urine. But hey, now, 2022, it's a sparkling monument of style, almost like it's brand new. It's spotless. And even Apple has a massive flagship here. And despite how busy it gets, it's a quite distinguished hub. It doesn't seem like a railway station. Well, not a conventional one, anyway. There's no screeching calls about trains, tracks, or delays. And all the transit paraphernalia is sort of hidden down away, down the tunnels, so you get this echoey kind of stillness. Kind of like you're in the Sistine Chapel. And above you, like a fresco in the ceiling. The celestial heavens are depicted, complete with halogen pin lights. Ironically, funny story, but a few days after it was opened, an amateur astronomer pointed out to Mr. Moneybags at Vanderbilt that all the constellations were back to front. They'd been put up the wrong way around. And they investigated and found that the painter had got it all wrong. It had his picture upside down. So the line was taken for PR was that it was meant to be like that and that you were looking at the sky not as a human being looking up, but as a god looking down. Probably what Trump, Musk and Bezos would have said. In New York, on the streets of Manhattan, when the morning rush hour is reaching its fevered peak, inside Grand Terminal, it still feels like a stately dance. Passing through this main concourse every day are millions of people. To give you an idea, that's the entire population of Sydney walking through here every day. And what's amazing is that none of them ever bump into each other. Even though they're moving at a rapid pace, they're not even brushing shoulders. And that's why, like a city in itself, because the city, or living in a city, is an opportunity for human beings to live in such close proximity to each other, but still go on with their jobs and get on with their lives without bumping into each other. With all the noise, colour, flush and bustle of Times Square, Broadway, Rockefeller Centre, 42nd Street, Midtown is the neighbourhood many picture first when they think of New York. Rockefeller Centre, Grand Central Terminal and St. Patrick's Cathedral are all among the world's most recognisable destinations. The neighbourhood isn't just sightseeing, however, it also boasts 
top flight restaurants, bars, including the theatre district's restaurant row and rowdy house kitchens, bars and clubs. When the Empire State Building was built in 1932, or opened in 1932, it was said that it was the closest place to heaven that a human being could be. Don't know about being close to heaven. You do get a pretty good view of Manhattan from up here. Something that I've never done before in all the time I lived here. Definitely gives you a sense of perspective on, there's the Flatiron Building down there on how small and compact New York City is or Manhattan is. But the building behind me when it was launched or opened to the public in 1932 was the tallest building in the world. And at over a hundred stories high, it's quite fascinating to know how it was built back then with the technology that they had. It was very much mechanical. They would weld hot rivets, molten hot rivets that were heated on site up in the heavens and they would throw them to each other and then hammer them into them, the steel eye beams that form the, the structure that stands today. And when 911 was happening, you can imagine that that was probably one of their prime targets. But thankfully, that's classic, probably, probably America's and maybe the world's most famous building stood. Um, it's a, a temple, a, a, a living monument to the art of Art Deco, and it's been faithfully restored, maintained, and now a center of tourism. And, and visitors from all over the world flock there to marvel at the actual engineering feat, and also its place in the center of Manhattan which you get a pretty good vantage point. You don't get quite up to the top, but you get to the 85th floor, and it's well worth a trip. Well, King Kong wouldn't have been a big movie without the Empire State Building. Diorama is quite cool. Do you know what it'd been like back then? <clears throat> Someone gets an idea that in the 1920s you're going to build what must have been considered to be an impossible engineering feat. And this is the way that it actually was built up. I know they do that time lapse thing. It's very tripped up. Obviously, it's an animation. Where were you in 1931, I wonder? And so they did it. They welded the hot metal rivets on the spot. What a job. The Chrysler Building is one of my favourites. It's an iconic Art Deco skyscraper located on the east side of Manhattan at the intersection of 42nd Street and Lexington Avenue. Standing 1,047 feet high, it was briefly the world's tallest building in 1930 before it was overtaken by the Empire State Building in 1931. And since the destruction of the World Trade Center in 2001, for, for a time, it was the second tallest building in New York. Featuring automobile-related designs around its facade, the Chrysler Building was built in homage to the success of the auto giant for which it is named. The gleaming Art Deco masterpiece on New York City's east side, with its stainless chromium nickel steel arches and narrow triangular windows, 
was a constant optimistic reminder of the possibilities inherent in the American capitalist system. Although the Chrysler building soon fell to number two spot in the New York skyline. The spirit and excesses of the period are forever frozen in its shiny surfaces, statement making spire and remarkable bold swordfish design. More than simply a structure and an architecturally magnificent one at that, the Chrysler building is a window into a short, vital and exciting period in American history. Times Square, baby. Home of Broadway, all the big Broadway productions. Another iconic destination in the Big Apple. And the people are out today too. So they've really taken Neon to the next level. God, the last time I was here, there wasn't a fraction of the Neon. The origin of this dynamic, crowded place was once known as Long Island Square, but it was renamed Times Square after being located in 1904 at the intersection of 42nd Street, the offices of the New York Times. In 1913, the newspaper's offices were moved to 229 43rd Street, and the building was named One Times Square in 1961. History of Times Square. At the beginning of the 20th, 20th century, Times Square became one of the most important places in New York City, with the construction of theatres, restaurants, and luxury first-class hotels. The site began to change in the 30s when it became a dangerous place with prostitution, crime and drugs. And this lasted for more than half a century. Kind of the era of taxi driver. The history of Times Square during the 1980s, Mayor Ed Koch and David Dinkins began a redevelopment project for Midtown Manhattan that included Times Square. In the 1990s, Mayor Rudolph Giuliani tackled the project to clean up the area with the closure of pornographic theatres, sex shops and the purchase of the nine historic theatres on 42nd Street by the State of New York. Times Square is located between 7th Avenue and Broadway and 42nd and 47th Streets. It's currently the heart of the city in general and of the New York Theatre District in particular. The entire area is illuminated day and night by large illuminated signs and huge television screens. This has made it famous throughout the world as well as the descent of the crystal ball Every December 31st from the top of One Times Square announcing the new year. We're up to 2 million people flock to see Times Square to ring in the year. With the lowering of the Waterford's Millennial Crystal Ball, a huge Swarovski crystal made specifically for the event. Times Square wouldn't be recognisable without the amazing illuminated signs. An image that is admired by 2 million people who pass through the square every day and the many millions more in the world who enjoy it through photographs, painting, cinema and television. Times Square began to fill with large advertisements in 1961 when the City Council encouraged its installation in part to the city. And since then, there are many who have passed through here. Some true works of art. Well, it's not really a place that I'd come for a relaxing Saturday afternoon, but I guess it works for some people. <clears throat> there's, 
They're literally like families with babies crawling everywhere. In fact, there's everybody is here. I don't really see the big attraction apart from like if you have a thing for lots of traffic and crowds and like you're a moth drawn to the neon signs and the big lights and bright lights. I don't think there's any theater victims here. But wait, is that El Pacino over there? There's Bumblebee or whatever it is. They have Transformers here. Ladies in wheelchairs. It's a fucking zoo, man. This is like the crowds that I remembered when it was New Year's Eve and the when the ball was gonna drop. We love you guys. He loves me. But this is the place where I wanted to, you know, do the Donia Luna retrospective where in the dramatization of the film. Zendaya comes here and sees her mother in one of Andy Warhol's screen tests. I thought that would be an amazing cinematic scene. All up here, as you can see. It's quite bizarre. Like every building is plastered in plasma screens or the latest digital screens. I can't, I can't tell you how crowded it is. Mm -hmm. And there's a little bit of traffic here too. Traffic of all kinds. Known as the lungs of the city, the building in Central Park was one of the 19th century New York's most massive public works. Some 20,000 workers, Yankee engineers, Irish labourers, German gardeners and native-born stonecutters reshaped the site's typography to create the impressive pastoral landscape. Central Park was the first landscape public park in the United States. Advocates of creating the park primarily were wealthy merchants and landowners who admired the public grounds of London and Paris and urged that New York needed a comparable facility to establish its international reputation. A public park, they argued, would offer their own families an attractive setting for their carriage rides and provide working class New Yorkers with a healthy alternative to the saloon. And after three years of debate over the park's site and cost, in 1853, the state legislature authorized the city of New York to use the powers of eminent domain to acquire more than 700 acres of land smack dab in the center of Manhattan. And this is a taste of how New Yorkers spend their Saturdays. It's a beautiful Saturday afternoon. Just walking back from the Met, famous art gallery, museum on the Upper East Side. Just walking under the trees next to Central Park here. You definitely get an overwhelming sense that there's a lot of people in the city. They used to say that 8 million people came into the city every day and then left again each evening. But it still leaves, it still left a couple of, couple of million people who stayed in Manhattan Island. And then there's the hordes of tourists. Even after COVID, the tourists are definitely back in force. 
It's always an exciting place. The best of the best come here. People from all around the world come here. It's definitely a cultural capital. And it is intense, let me tell you. When I lived in New York City the first time, Soho and Tribeca, which are downtown, were the coolest neighborhoods in all of New York City to live. But based on my recent visit, I would say that those days are long over. In fact, the whole island of Manhattan to me is more like a crowded theme park than a place to reside. Although the exteriors of the buildings in Soho are still stunning and maintain a special place in my heart. Brooklyn, and in particular Williamsburg, long ago took the title for Hipster Central. So is Brooklyn now the best place to hang your hat in New York? It could well be. New York City is often considered America's greatest city. A lot of people would say that it's overrated and tend to say that New Yorkers are rude and full of themselves just because they are able to live in the city. While some of that may be true to an extent, the reality is that it's pretty hard to argue that New York City is one of the most remarkable cities on the planet. And love it or loathe it, it is remarkable. Most tourists that fall in love with New York City are actually falling in love with Manhattan though. And that's a shame because New York actually has five boroughs, four of them which might get overlooked because Manhattan is the most extravagant and flashy of them all. Of all the boroughs though, Manhattan included, Brooklyn may just be the most special, often seen as Manhattan's younger, less accomplished sibling by the outside world. The truth is that those who actually live in Brooklyn feel that they are the most definitely in the best borough by far. Generally speaking, Brooklyn neighborhoods tend to have a more open and residential feel. The streets are more expansive and the buildings aren't as tall as you'd find in Manhattan. The pace of life also tends to be slower and the sense of community is stronger. One of the most iconic images in all of um, New York City. Dumbo. And right between the base of the towers and the bridge, Manhattan Bridge, peeking up is the Empire State Building. It's the Monument Men. the colored section, and we're lucky to get all the Amos and Andys and Madam Queens and Ruby Taylor strutting their stuff. My, but the gold dust twins have grown. From the size of this fella's hat, he must be the head man. This is the Harlem River, the extreme northern end of the island of Manhattan, and the end of this exploration. Harlem is known internationally as the black mecca of the world. But Harlem has actually been home to many races and ethnic groups, including the Dutch, the Irish, the German, Italian, and Jewish. 
Harlem was originally settled by the Dutch in 1658, but it was largely farmland and undeveloped territory for the following 200 years. Now, New York neighborhoods have different reputations. Some would say the Upper East Side is wealthy. The East Village is edgy. Times Square is full of tourists and Greenwich Village is a very liberal place. But Harlem's reputation is more nuanced. And recently, Harlem has been on and up. It's become an up and coming neighborhood with buoyant restaurants, colorful entertainment venues and gorgeous brownstones. For instance, a historic um, brownstone in Harlem was listed for over $6 million recently. So Harlem is home to this clash between the old and the new. Its reputation as a neighborhood rich in history is well deserved and gives the neighborhood its iconic soul character. Harlem is most renowned for the Harlem Renaissance and the cultural production of that era. Its famed history is deeply rooted in black culture and also the 1900s. To this day, Harlem is associated with black culture and the tourists that come to get a glimpse of it. During the economic boom of the mid 1800s, after the Civil War, the neighborhood experienced an influx of Jewish, Italian and black residents. In the early 1900s, Jim Crow policies and the rapid industrialization of the northern cities resulted in a mass migration of black people seeking better opportunities. And from 1910 to 1930, the black population in central Harlem jumped from 10% to 70%, while the Italian and Jewish populations dropped significantly. Are you ready, black people? Are you ready? Are you really ready? Are you ready to listen to all the beautiful black voices, the beautiful black feeling, the beautiful black waves moving in beautiful air? Are you ready, black people? Are you ready? Nobody ever heard of the Harlem Culture Festival. Nobody would believe it happened. Six weekends of major artists. The Panthers were the security and kids were sitting up on the trees. I was nervous. I didn't expect a crowd like that. Something very important was happening. It wasn't just about the music. 1969 was a change of era in the black community. The styles were changing. Music was changing. And revolution was coming together. We are a new people. We are a beautiful people. And then there is the Summer of Soul, the feature movie, the award-winning movie that I think won Best Feature Documentary at the 2021 Academy Awards, which captured the very essence of Harlem and its peoples. In Summer of Soul, Amir Questlove Thompson presents a powerful and transporting documentary. It's part music film, part historical record, created around an epic event that happened in Harlem that celebrated black history, culture and fashion. Over the course of six weeks in the summer of 1969, just 100 miles south of Woodstock, which was also happening at the very same time, the Harlem Cultural Festival was filmed in Marcus Garvey Park and the footage had been lost, never seen and largely unforgotten until now. The Summer of Soul shines a light on the importance of history to our spiritual well-being and stands as a testament to the healing power of music during times of unrest, both past and present. In Harlem, it was the home of musicians, street artists, poets, artistic geniuses hidden away behind classic brick wall houses. They created an electric atmosphere and culture. The 1920s were a particularly golden era here. Harlemites were riding high on the economic high and jazz was being developed in the hallowed halls at venues like the Cotton Club, where musicians such as Duke Ellington and Louis Armstrong played in the Apollo Theatre, and life was good. The smell of soul food enriched the air, 
as restaurants popped up everywhere and tied the new city age hope with the old southern traditions. Activists like Malcolm X noted the poor living conditions in their neighbourhoods and sought to bring back Harlem's former glory. They led protests and strikes to address these issues. And through these hard-fought battles, Harlem gained a new reputation as a site for change and progress. When you walk around Harlem today, especially central Harlem, you're faced with a strange conundrum. You see a mix of gorgeous brownstones easily worth millions of dollars lining the streets. But then if you walk a few blocks away on the same avenue, you see dilapidated buildings covered in graffiti, which are literally desolate, as though a war had taken place there. 